This is the ninth in a series of lectures on differential geometry. In this lecture, we want to think about Lie groups, and we want to think particularly about how to examine them through the microscope. Every group has a distinguished element, its identity element. So if we want to work from some point in a group, the natural point to stand on is the identity element. We imagine then we look at the structure of the Lie group as seen from the point of view of the identity element. The first step in trying to understand the local picture of a Lie group, we can imagine trying to uh, deal with the problem of multiple connected components. If we have a Lie group that has more than one connected component, um, one only one of those components has the identity element on it, and that's where we'll be standing, studying our group. So um, we consider uh, the identity component, let's say G0, contained in G, and um, and we then uh, consider, um, uh, well, I'll leave you as a problem to show that it's actually a normal subgroup. Um, and that means there's a quotient group. So there is a quotient group, which is this guy. And, um, and of course, there's a group morphism to the quotient. But um, not only that, so this guy uh, then has a discrete topology. And this guy has its Lie group topology, and then this guy sits inside there. And then we end up with this sequence of maps. Um, so this one is, is connected. It's the component of the identity element uh, in our picture. It's this guy here, G0. Here's all of G. It has maybe many com components, right? And you know that the topological components and the path components of a manifold are the same, which is an easy exercise. So um, so this is connected. Uh, this is just any old Lie group, and this is a discrete group. And so what we've realized then is that, um, is that uh, to classify Lie groups, we need to first classify um, uh, the connected ones. That'll be the ones that play this part here. And then we need to classify all of the discrete ones because that'll be discrete. So we have to classify all of those. And then we have to find all the ways of, as, as it's called, extending. That is to say, put a, a group in the middle here between a discrete group and a connected group, extending a, um, uh, a, a discrete group by a connected group to produce an arbitrary Lie group. Um, So that reduces the problem of classifying Lie groups to three problems, classifying connected, discrete, and uh, then classifying the ways of extending. All three problems are not solvable in general. Nobody knows how to find all the connected Lie groups, all discrete groups, or all the ways of extending. Um, but in practice, usually discrete groups that show up aren't very complicated. When we have a Lie group, this is its group of components. Um, so in our example, let's say uh, this is the G0, and then the quotient group consists of just two points, one for each component. So this would be the G mod G naught, G naught. It's, um, it's a group that has a point for each component of the original group. You squish it down to a point. Um, the discrete groups that arise, for instance, in this example, there are only two points there. Discrete groups arising are usually not very complicated. Uh, the extensions can be fairly complicated, and the connected parts are fairly complicated. But that means that, by and large, we're mostly interested in the connected ones. So from now on, we'll focus attention on connected Lie groups. We'll want to work with small chunks of Lie groups, a small piece at a time, and then try and build up from there. So we'll need to understand um, one of the fundamental observations about uh, the structure of a Lie group. Uh, simple lemma is that any open subset, say U containing G in a Lie group, in any Lie group, uh, generates A subgroup, okay, so any subset always generates, of course, a subgroup, but if it's open, and it generates a subgroup consisting of consisting of uh, uh, a union of of components. Of the original group, so in our picture, uh, if we take an open subset inside our group, say some little chunk of it here, 
and then some other little chunk of it over here. And we look at the subgroup they generate, they'll generate some union of components. There might be some other components where they, do, they don't arise. Um, and uh, the proof is, is fairly straightforward. Um, so for the proof, uh, we'll just um, take the... Um, we take uh, the uh, the subgroup, so we have some uh, open subset, and then we let H be the subgroup it generates. Um, now what we do is we pick a point. Um, we take a point G in U, a point H in H. Then um, uh, then of course what we find because it's a because it's a group, we have that H uh, times G inverse is also in H. And therefore, H G inverse U is also uh, contained in H. And um, so, uh, so that means that this guy lives inside an open subset inside H. So, little H uh, is in this open subset, which is contained in H. Um, and so, um, so H is open. Now, if we take something that's outside. H, uh, not in H, then by the same argument, uh, GH is outside H, um, and so uh, N is open, since H is open, and so uh, so that means that the complement of H is also open, G minus H is therefore open, and so H uh, is open, and its complement is open, and therefore uh, it's a union of components. So here's a nice application of that of that result. Um, uh, we can prove the following uh, useful fact that uh, it's a theorem. It's just an observation for us. We won't really need this result, but it's an interesting fact that um, uh, every uh, finite dimensional um, field extension extension of the real numbers uh, is either the real numbers or the complex numbers. And the proof of this result um, comes from just a very simple uh, observation about the, the about Lie groups. Um, suppose we have the real numbers and they sit inside the uh, some field extension I'll call it little k. Um, so it's a, it's a field in the sense of algebra and it contains the real number field. Um, and we can assume that it's not equal to the real numbers because otherwise it would be would be done. So there it means in particular it must be the case that as a real vector space it must have dimension at least two. Let's let um, k cross be the, the traditional notation for k, but with the zero element taken out, uh, the non-zero elements, and that's a Lie group uh, under. Uh, multiplication. Why? Because, well, its multiplication is just a linear transformation of each of the factors. So, by linear algebra, it's a it's a linear operation, and so it's so it's smooth. And then, um, so it gives us a, a Lie group. Now, we consider the, the the map which just squares elements. Um, so, we consider the map S takes, let's say, k cross to k cross, given by taking any, any element in the group. I'll call it, let's say, X in the non-zero elements of the uh, of the field and giving us x squared also in the non-zero elements of the field. So um, this is a smooth map because it, because the multiplication is smooth. And we can differentiate this map explicitly. Um, if you just expand out, uh, you'll find easily that uh, as prime of x, the linear operation, the linear transformation on, on vectors that corresponds to this thing. Uh, is uh, the the, mul the squaring operation is just 2xh. That's just right. That derivative of x squared is 2x. Um, so through uh, the linear transformation, which is s prime of x, is just 2x, and that's the same as in the real numbers uh, in one variable calculus. Okay. So in particular, this is a linear isomorphism. If x is not zero, this is a linear isomorphism. It can't be zero on a non-zero h. And so, therefore, that tells us that S is actually a local diffeomorphism um, by the implicit function theorem, or by the inverse function theorem. Um, so the image of S is open.
So there's an open set of elements that are in fact uh, squares of something. And we know that K cross um, is a sphere, or sorry, is a, well, it's, um, sorry, it's K minus zero. It's a vector space with the origin deleted, and uh, the dimension of the vector space is two or more. And so it's not hard to convince yourself it's actually connected. Right? If you, if you uh, take the plane and you puncture it at the origin, or you take three-dimensional space and you puncture it at the origin or whatever, then you get a connected uh, manifold. So, um, so this is a connected manifold K cross, and we have this guy uh, having an open image, and so it takes K cross to K cross. It must have an open image. Um, and uh, so it must be, therefore, that S of K cross has to be actually K cross because, uh, because the image is open, um, and uh, uh, it has to be an open subgroup. Uh, but an open subgroup is a union of components by our result, and uh, this guy's connected, so it doesn't have any 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 uh, it has only one component, and so that gives us that the image is uh, is is everything, and that means in particular that uh, K cross um, uh, K cross has well everything is a square, so it has a square root of minus 1. So it's starting to look like the complex numbers because we've got a square root of minus 1. Okay, so um, so now we've got to um, to try to figure out that it is the complex numbers. Um, so we look at our next um, our next step is to look at uh, the equation uh, s of x is 1. Um, uh, well, that that's exactly saying x squared is 1. And that's the same as saying x minus 1, x plus 1 is 0. So x is 1 or minus 1 in our field. Um, so that has two solutions, right? So, um, right. Um, now, our, our field actually contains, of course, the real numbers. It sits inside our field. So the non-zero, not real numbers, uh, sit inside the non-zero um, elements of the field. Um, so when we square, what happens with those numbers? Um, when we square, we find that the, um, the non-zero real numbers uh, square to become positive because, um, well, let's say greater than zero, positive numbers. So the non-zero numbers square to be positive. Um, and so that means that our S takes um, the non-zero elements of the field up to real rescaling to um, the non-zero elements of the field up to um, uh, positive rescaling. So uh, so that's the, the, the weird bit here. Um, now we know what this thing is. This thing is a real projective space. And this thing is a sphere. And so what we have is some kind of map like this. The quotient is, is this kind of... Uh, Kind of an object, and so what we have is a is a, a diffeomorphism. It's a well, it's it's a two to one uh, local diffeomorphism from the real projective space to the sphere, um, and because they're com both compact, um, that means it must be a covering map. Okay, so it's a covering map. Now, if we had the special case where uh, where we're dealing with um, uh, with uh, k cross was uh, dimension 2, or let's say k is dimension 2, uh, then this is okay. We can have a covering map because we're dealing with, well, this should be really rpn minus 1 since we're dealing with uh, an n-dimensional field. Um, so if this is dimension 2, this is dimension 1, and then it's just a circle going to a circle. And you can wrap a circle around a circle any number of times because remember rp1 is just a circle. Um, a circle can wrap around a circle any number of times. So in that case, it works. But in higher dimensions, it doesn't work. Um, so uh, the uh, real projective space can't be a cover of the sphere for n um, uh, bigger than or equal to uh, 3. It's not possible uh, to have such a covering map because this guy's not simply connected and this guy is simply connected. And so I won't uh, do all the topology needed to, to make sense out of that. If you're not familiar with covering spaces, that's fine. But the rough idea is that the sphere looks somehow 
like this, it's simply connected. Little loops can be contracted. Little tiny loops can be, or very large loops, can be contracted to a point, and that's not true here. But if it was a covering space, the loop would lift to, uh, to some kind of, of loop that would, uh, that would then have to be contractible. Loops have to lift contractibly. And, and then, there, of course, loops here that are non-contractible would have to be um, going down to something non-contractible. So, uh, so it doesn't work because that's not a covering of that by some results in covering space theory, which we might have seen, hopefully, in your algebra class. Um, so it gives you some idea how we can use this Lie group results to get some interesting results about algebra. Returning to our main, uh, our main theme here, we're really interested in Lie uh, groups and looking at, the, at them in the small. So we imagine we have some Lie group and we look at it near the identity element. Um, so to look at something near the identity element, if it's a manifold, naturally we look at its tangent space. And so, um, so we'll, we'll use um, the standard uh, funny uh, way of writing. The tangent space at the identity point of any Lie group is always written traditionally in some strange German uh, script which for the letter G looks something like this. The, for the other letters, you can look in the lecture notes. I, I'm not very good at drawing them. I can only really draw that one and the letter A I can do um, for abelian groups. But otherwise, I, I can't really do the others, so I just do some sort of script for if, for if I have a group named H, call it something, it's Lie algebra, something like H, or this, this tangent space at the identity, something like H. Okay, so, um, so I'll let you look at the notes to find how to write all those other ones. Um, let's take a look at some examples uh, where we can calculate out the tangent spaces of uh, some groups at some elements. Um, so a nice example would be, let's say, um, if we let G be the orthogonal group, that's the n by n orthogonal matrices with real entries. Okay, so a matrix is orthogonal just when it satisfies this identity, that it's transposed times the matrix is the identity element. Um, again, following the tradition in Lie group theory, we usually write n by n matrices, thinking of them as elements of a group, write them as little g because they're elements of a group. Um, if we write this out, this matrix, uh, if we were to have it move over time through this group, so we have some sort of orthogonal group, uh, G, if we were to look at the identity element, and we were to watch a path move along through the group and pass through the identity element, that would be some path G of T. Um, and if we assume that it passes through the identity element at time zero, so G of zero is identity, then we can expand out in a Taylor series. and It's a matrix valued function, right? The, each element of the orthogonal group is an n by n matrix. So this is a matrix whose entries vary smoothly with some parameter t, some time t. And if we expand it out, then it should, of course, have, uh, well, it, the zero, it passes through the identity, and then it has some velocity and some higher order terms. Um, the velocity directions we usually write as capital letters and the positions with, with little letters. Um, so, um, so then that gives us our velocity at time zero. Now we can plug into this equation here, which describes the orthogonal group. So the orthogonal group is exactly the set of matrices G satisfying this equation. This is the equation of the orthogonal group. Plug this uh, expression for G into there and just differentiate. And I'll leave you to check that the equation you come up with is exactly that the velocity vector has to satisfy that its transpose plus itself is zero. It's an anti-symmetric matrix. So what we found is that if you have a a point moving on the orthogonal group, a point G of t moving on the orthogonal group at toward time t, then as it passes through the identity element, its velocity is an anti-symmetric matrix. It's a matrix function over time, and its velocity is a matrix, and it's got to be anti-symmetric. On the other hand, we can also, uh, given, we can go back the other way, given A and the anti-symmetric matrix, of course, it has to be square matrix, um, n by n. Then uh, we can try, uh, as one possible path, we can try g of t is the exponential of t times a. As we discussed before, we can take the exponential of a matrix, which we won't worry about in detail. We'll let you do the analysis to figure out why there are such exponentials of matrices. And that gives you a path with this velocity. If you expand it out, it's identity plus t a plus da 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 da. So you can see, on the one hand, that if we had a path in the orthogonal group, 
its velocity would be an anti-symmetric matrix, but if we have an anti-symmetric matrix, we can produce a path in the orthogonal group with that velocity. Of course, we can produce many others as well as that one. So in this example, what we have finally is that this script G, however we write that, is the tangent space to the group G. In our case, our group is the orthogonal group. So the tangent space to the orthogonal group at the identity element, which is now the identity matrix. Sometimes writing my identity elements as one, and sometimes because they're almost always matrices, writing them as identity matrix. Um, and uh, it's exactly the set of n by n anti-symmetric matrices A. Okay, so that's the that is this tangent space with this fancy notation for it. Almost the same uh, computation that I won't go through the through the details. Almost the same computation gives you the um, elementary. Uh, observation that the uh, tangent space of the orthogonal group uh, over the unitary group, the tangent space of the identity to the unitary group is um, the set of uh, n by n uh, skew uh, joint matrices. What does that mean? Uh, skew a joint, so it's going to be n by n matrix, and it's got to satisfy the equation uh, A star plus a is zero. Okay, um, so that identifies for us a couple of these um, tangent spaces of these various groups. So we have some sort of group and we have some identity element and we have a tangent space there. And that's the sort of microscopic picture, at least the beginning of a microscopic picture of a Lie group. There are lots of other examples in the in the notes. One of the simple ones is that the tangent space of the identity element to the group of determinant one matrices. Um, so this, remember, is this is the set of matrices with determinant equal to one, and that's a group because a determinant is a morphism of groups. So that uh, is exactly the set of n by n uh, matrices with trace equal to zero. So determinant equals to one, demo differentiates and becomes trace equal to zero. Uh, um, if a matrix has determinant one, then its velocity as it moves through the identity matrix it has trace zero, and conversely. Now, um, we want to uh, move away from the identity element. We've thought about the identity element. Now, we want to imagine um, how we can start moving away from there. Um, so if we have uh, an element, let's say G0, we fix an element in our group, what we can do is we can map every element of the group to another element of the group by multiplying by that given G0. So we fix an element G0, we multiply all the elements by G0, everybody in the group. And it moves the whole group around. It's a diffeomorphism, and it's traditionally called left multiplication because we multiply on the left side. Um, so it's left multiplication. And it's usually written L G naught or something like that. And it's a diffeomorphism. And why is it diffeomorphism? Because multiplication is smooth, so it's a smooth map. And you can invert it by uh, left multiplying by the inverse. Left multiplication by G naught inverse is left multiplication by G naught inverse. Similarly, we have a right multiplication, um, almost the same story. Uh, right multiplication by G naught. G is G naught G. And you can check that uh, by uh, using the the mapping, taking G to G inverse, left multiplications become right multiplications and vice versa. So the whole theory of left multiplication of right multiplication is essentially identical under uh, replacing everything by its inverse. So we'll only try and prove things for the left, and but we'll state them for left and right. And we said that we wanted to move away from the identity element. We've described its tangent space, and that's really all we're going to look at there. But as we move away from it, what do things look like, or how do we move away from it? So we imagine we have this group, um, and we sit at the identity element, but we wish we were sitting somewhere else at some point, G naught. How can we get from here to here? Um, there are two obvious ways. Left multiplication by G naught takes every element G to 
g naught g. And so in particular, left element multiplication by g naught applied to 1 is g naught. So that is one way to move from here to here. There's another way, um, which is that right multiplication by g naught also uh, multiplies by g naught, so it multiplies 1 by g naught. So there are two ways. We can think of it that there are sort of two different left and right multiplication operations that are going to take us there, where we want to go. Um, so that means that if we stood at the identity element, uh, and we, um, we stood at the identity element, and we held in our hands a tangent vector, uh, let's call it A, then we could move to another point, any other point we wanted to, any point G naught, and we could construct a corresponding vector. And that's something we can't do in a general manifold. Tangent space at one point is a different vector space than the tangent space at another point, and there's no canonical way to identify them all. In fact, there's even no continuous way to identify them all in many manifolds. But in, on a Lie group, in this Lie group, we have a special operation of left multiplication, which takes one to wherever we want to go to. Uh, left multiplication by g naught takes one to g naught. And then it must do something with this vector. It must do something with it, so it must take it to something. Left multiplication by g naught uh, star of that vector is some other vector. So this operation is taking the point to this, this point to this point, and it's a diffeomorphism, so it takes tangent vectors to tangent vectors. So it must be the po possible then to smoothly identify this vector, which we can think of as the vector at g naught that corresponds to this vector at one. Now, there's more than one way to do this, of course, because we could have right multiplied as well. Um, so we'd end up with a different object if we did it the other way around, if we did it using the, the right multiplication. What we can do, then, is to construct globally a vector field over the whole manifold. Let's concentrate first on just the left multiplication picture. We take this vector a at the w point 1, and then at any other point, we compute out, let's say at g, we compute out at some, let's say, g naught we left translate to g naught at some point g1. We left translate to g1 at any point, say, g2. We left translate to g2. Um, and that'll smoothly move our vector over our whole manifold, creating a vector field over the entire manifold. So every one vector at one tangent space, just in one tangent space at one point, then extends to this vector field which is defined over the whole space. And it's defined simply by the formula that um, the, the vector field, which I tend to write as something like this, the, the vector field associated to a vector. So we take a vector at a single point at the tangent space. We create a vector field, which at any element g in the group is defined to be left translate from g, the given vector. So that. Uh, defines the so-called left invariant vector field. It's called left invariant because we created it by left translating from each point to each other point. And so if we left translate, it always gives us this result. If we left translate this vector field from one point to another, the result is, because left translations multiply together, um, the result is that it's invariant. In other words, we can say that the, as a vector field defined on the whole manifold, its left translation by anything, let's say x, uh, is itself. Um, so it satisfies this equation because its definition was take the vector at the identity element and just left translate it over to get a vector wherever you want to be. And because that's how you constructed it by left translating all over the place, and when you left translate it, it doesn't move, it doesn't change. So this gives us a left invariant vector field. And the notions here apply, of course, with right invariants instead of left invariants. So we trivially get um, a right invariant vector field, which I tend to write something like uh, pointing the other way. Uh, and its definition is right translate by the element g, the vector from the identity element. So again, we've got a picture of a group at the identity element of the group. We've got a tangent space, we've got a vector. And then you want to move over to here to some point g. By, you do it by right translating by g, it takes the identity to g, and it takes that vector to some vector, uh, which is right, sorry, right translate by g applied to, differentiated, applied to vectors. Um, and that gives us a vector field defined globally on the whole 
uh, on the whole manifold. So we found a way to extend. And it's what you'd expect in Euclidean space. When you work in Euclidean space, if you just pick a vector at a single point, you can translate it to the whole Euclidean space by just sliding it around. In Euclidean space, you have a vector over here. You can just move it over to here. You can move it over here by just sliding the picture around. And that's what we're doing here, too. We're using the group structure, which is, after all, what we used in Euclidean space. We translate one point to another by using the group structure, the fact that Euclidean space is an abelian group under addition. So now if we have a non-abelian group or any kind of group under, um, under any kind of horrible operation, we can always move points to points by these le right, left or right translations. And so we can slide any vector around and move it around and produce a left invariant or a right invariant vector field. The fact that there's a, a left way to do it and a right way to do it doesn't appear in Euclidean space. Now you can check that in Euclidean space, left translation and right translation are equal. In fact, that's true in any abelian, uh, abelian group that left and right translation are the same thing. And so that's why we only ha know of, in our ordinary experience, one way to move a vector field from one place to another in Euclidean space, grab hold of it and slide it over. And that's the only thing you can do in Euclidean space, because you know, Euclidean space is, is an abelian group, and so it doesn't know the difference between left and right. But in a more general group, you will have different left and right translations. Abstractly, this gives us, um, before we work out some concrete examples, um, abstractly, this gives us a, a, a special kind of structure on, the, on this tangent space at the identity. It's the tangent space at the identity, but you can identify any uh, vector A in that one tangent space with either the left invariant vector field, or if you prefer, you could use the right invariant vector field. And so that identifies that one tangent space with a collection of vector fields. Uh, so we take one vector at one point, as we said, and we translate it around the whole group. Take one vector at one point, and we move it around by our translations, and they produce a vector field on the entire Lie group. Um, and so we could think of that vector at that one point as being that vector field. The two things are the same data, the same information. When you have the vector field, you can calculate its value at the identity. You get that its value at the identity element of the group is A. On the other hand, so that's how you can pass from the vector field to the vector. From the vector to the vector field, you can say that the vector field's value at any point is the left translate of its value at the identity. So you can go this way or this way between vector fields and vectors. And so we can think of the tangent space at the identity element not as a single vector space, but also but just but as like a collection a collection of vector fields. Um, okay, so we, we can think of it two ways, either as being a single vector space at a single point, and that makes it obvious that it's a finite dimensional object, or we can think of it as the collection of left invariant vector fields. What we have is that this tangent space is identified with the set of left invariant, or if you prefer, right invariant vector fields. Now, a left invariant vector field is invariant under a certain diff collection of diffeomorphisms, the left translations. So, um, so if we think of it that way, then um, it's, uh, it's, it's not so surprising that the brackets of left invariant vector fields are left invariant. Um, in fact, the brackets of vector fields invariant under a diffeomorphism are invariant under the same diffeomorphism. So it's immediately clear that um, that uh, G identified with left invariant vector fields on uh, the group G, um, that this is invariant under bracket. We'll see examples in a bit. You can take brackets of left invariant vector fields and get left invariant vector fields. But once you take, say, two elements in here, you take some vectors, and this is just at the tangent space at the identity point, two, t two tangent vectors at that one point, A and B, tangent to that one point, then you left translate them both to produce left invariant vector fields, then you bracket, and then you take the value back at the identity element again. And that will give you uh, a, a bracket structure on the um, on the tangent space at the identity. We simply define the bracket of two uh, elements uh, to be uh, two two vectors at the identity to be the vector at the identity, given by requiring that the bracket 
of um, of the vector fields uh, should be um, this guy's uh, less than variant vector field. So we calculate out the less than variant vector fields, we bracket them, and then we calculate the value of that at the identity, and that gives us uh, something called AB. Let's see what that looks like. But what it's what we can say already, without knowing much about it, is that it turns um, this uh, G, which was uh, initially defined to be just a single tangent vector space, so just a, vec a single vector space of same dimension as big G, it's just a vector space, but uh, turns it into an algebra because you can bracket. And when you bracket you that, you can think of that as multiplying. And you already know how to add because it's a vector space. So that makes it an algebra. The structure of that algebra turns out to be the kind of microscopic structure of the group. We can imagine that in some sense we're zooming in on the identity element in the, in the group by looking just at the tangent space of the identity. So that's our or German G, and that this bracketing operation we've defined is in effect uh, turning that one vector space into an algebra, which in some sense approximates the rather complicated structure of the group by the simpler structure of an algebra on a single vector space. Before this becomes um, outrageously uh, abstract, or maybe just slightly after, it uh, it'd be a good idea to f work out an example to see if we can calculate out these these brackets on a simple case where we know how everything works. Um, so let's, let's um, as usual, we'll let uh, k be either the real numbers or the complex numbers or the quaternions. And um, again, you don't need to pay too much attention to the quaternions. Let's look at our favorite example, which is just the general linear group. Um, uh, that's, again, that's the n by n invertible, invertible uh, matrices. Uh, with coefficients from the from from either the real complex or quaternions, depending on which value k we want to work with. Um, now, of course, this guy then this general linear group, it's all the invertible matrices, um, and so it's an open subset in the set of all n by n matrices. And so its tangent space is all of them. When you have a and, and you're working in a vector space, and you have an open set, um, then. Uh, its tangent space at any point is the whole space. You can move inside the open set a little bit in any direction. So your tangent va your vectors can be any tangent vectors can be any vectors at all in any direction. You can move that direction inside the open set. And so and you have any open set of in here it's a submanifold but its tangent space is the tangent space of the whole manifold. So that means the tangent space of the identity uh, matrix to this group is our script G is just all n by n matrices. So that's not too scary. If you have an open collection of n by n matrices, you get to move in them in any direction you like. So in other words, if you slightly perturb an invertible matrix, it stays invertible, so you can move with any velocity you like. You can buy any uh, matrix at all. And as long as you don't move for too long, you'll stay in the invertible matrices. So that gives us the tangent space. And now what we want to do is to work out the brackets. And um, we know the left translation uh, if you take two matrices and left translate one by the other, it's just matrix multiplication. That's not very deep. Um, the ma the, the uh, operation of multiplication is matrix multiplication. But then what does it mean to, to take um, a left invariant vector field? We take some uh, uh, n by n matrix, so our velocities are just n by n matrices, and then we want to construct a left invariant vector field. It's supposed to be defined by the formula that at each matrix G, the left invariant vector field is moving that matrix according to a velocity, which is given by left translating the given matrix um, by G. But left translating was just multiplying a matrix on the left. So left translating derivative, because this is already linear, here's the trick, this is a linear transformation. Our left translation is multiplying by this G naught. Multiplying by a matrix is linear operation on matrices. And so its derivative is itself. That is to say, multiplying on the left by G naught star um, is uh, applied to a matrix A is just a G naught A. It's the same thing. When you differentiate a linear transformation, like this one, you, you get the same linear transformation. The linear approximation to a linear transformation is that linear transformation. So that means we can plug that in here and simply get that this guy is simply G A. 
so we've calculated out explicitly the uh, the left translation. It's trivial to to see that what happens at the right uh, translation. You get uh, the right invariant factor field value at g uh, is just uh, a g. If I got it right. Um, so uh, so that's why the little arrow tells you which side to put the a on. Um, gives you a nice reason for my notation here of putting little arrows on. The little arrow says that when you compete with matrices, the A goes on the other side of the G. A applied to G is GA, so that's why the little arrow tells you which way to, where to put the A. And this says the other way around, that A of G is put the A on the on this side. So that's why I, I use this notation. It's not common in the literature, the notation A. In fact, I'm the only one who uses it. Um, this notation for left and right invariant vector fields is not standard in the literature. The standard in the literature notation is to call this thing capital XA. And the standard in the literature is that this doesn't have a name, um, which is unfortunate. So uh, if you're reading other sources, you may find something like that, um, which is unfortunate. OK, but we haven't actually calculated out what is the bracket. Um, so we want to figure out how do we find brackets of these, of these um, vector fields. And um, I'll let you uh, carry that out as an exercise. But I'll just give the answer here that um, the bracket of uh, the left invariant vector field A and the left invariant vector field B, where we take A and B to be any uh, n by n matrices. We want to know how they move matrices. Remember again that at each matrix G, invertible matrix G, this vector field's value is defined to be this vector. Okay, so we plug that in here for two matrices A and B, and if you calculate it out, I'll leave you to do the calculation that you get um, that this is exactly a b left invariant vector field where uh, a b has to be you can compute it it has to be the only thing it can be which is exactly a b minus b a as matrices or this is matrix multiplication That's matrix multiplication. So this enables us to compute out completely explicitly for our example, what is the bracket of the vector fields? We take uh, two elements, A and B, to n by n matrices. We abstractly construct these vector fields associated to them. And then we bracket the vector fields. But the bracket of the vector fields turns out to be just the ordinary um, so-called commutator bracket of matrices. So it's not very interesting. Um, but it's very computable. That's what's really important. Um, so you could actually work this out. And we will work this out in some simple examples. But it, now another observation that's sort of straightforward here is that um, all of our examples, almost all, pretty much all examples, are uh, subgroups of some GL and K. Um, and so we know the bracket for GL and K, so we know all the brackets for all the examples. Let's do that in some simple cases and see what they look like. So let's see if we can work out an, another simple example, um, maybe even simpler than working out GLNK. Let's just work out SO3, the 3 by 3 rotation matrices. Now, um, by the same uh, computation that we did for, we did, um, for the orthogonal group, um, the same computation gives you that the Lie algebra, which again is traditionally written as sort of small letters, except they should be those should be German letters, and I can't really draw them, so I'll just write them as little letters. Um, so this is the group with the capital letters. Its Lie algebra has the little tiny letters. The elements of the group have small letters. The elements of the Lie algebra have big letters. So this is again is supposed to be the tangent space, the identity element, to SO3 as an abstract vector space. But um, we can calculate what that is. We already did the orthogonal group. And so we can use the same computation. It's not hard to check. It still works. It's the set of 3 by 3 anti-symmetric matrices. Matrices. OK, so this is, uh, what do those look like? They look like, well, let's take a 3 by 3 matrix and ask that it be anti-symmetric. Um, so if it's anti-symmetric, that is to say, remember, anti-symmetric means that it's transpose plus it is equal to 0. I'll leave you to check for a 3 by 3. If you work it all out, it looks like 0 minus C, B 
minus a, 0, 0, a, minus b, c. Okay, it's, there exists, exists, it exists exactly three numbers a, b, c, so that that looks like that. Okay, so that's the, um, the, um, the anti-symmetric 3 by 3 matrices all look like this. And associated to that is an obvious uh, vector, which is um, we create a vector a, b, c in our 3. So this is a 3 by 3 matrix, and I'm saying that all the anti-symmetric 3 by 3s can be written uniquely like this for some choice of a, b, c. And I've com carefully chosen the plus and minus signs in this expression so that if I say, well, to each vector I'm associating this matrix, then um, we can check that uh, the bracket of the, of the matrices, again, ma bracket is supposed to be uh, a, b is uh, a, b. Uh, minus b a, and I'm going to let you check that under the under this uh, linear um, isomorphism, it's going to take the anti-symmetric matrices. So that's my little S O three anti-symmetric matrices. And it's going to take it to R three, and it's going to take the bracket here to the cross product. So this explains where cross product really came from. Cross product is somehow about Lie algebras and about brackets. It's the simplest example of um, of bracketing in a Lie algebra. What we're doing is calculating the infinitesimal rotation of something, and we're saying infinitesimal rotation is given by by um, by cross product. Um, in classical mechanics, that's referred to the the the, the associated vector is here is referred to as the angular velocity of the rotation, as something moves. Uh, around by rotation, it has an angular velocity which represents how quickly it's rotating. It's a velocity of rotation. You can write it as a vector and use cross products to represent its motion. In, in a classical mechanics course you'll see how that's done, but, um, but you could also think of it as really being part of a more general theory of, uh, of the Lie algebra representing the infinitesimal motion of a rotation, or more generally the infinitesimal motion of some kind of element of some Lie group. Our Lie group is the rotation matrices, so its Lie algebra represents infinitesimal ro rotations in three-dimensional space, and those are represented by angular velocity in exactly this way, matching up Lie bracket here with cross product here, explaining where cross product comes from. Another simple example, um, where I won't do all the details, but you can easily see how to do them, is the Heisenberg group. Um, so a group arises in some descriptions of quantum mechanics, which we won't worry about. But the Heisenberg group, uh, which in the notation I've adopted is called N3, um, it's the set of 3 by 3 strictly uh, triangular, upper triangular, uh, upper triangular matrices with real entries. Um, so we'll do the, just the real case. Um, so it's the set of all matrices that look like, well, you've got to have ones down the diagonal. It's three by three, so there'll only be three of those. Zeros under the diagonal, and then some elements that I'll just call A, B, C. I don't know of a good no notational convention like I did for SO3, so I'll just put them in, in any order. So A, B, and C can be any real numbers. You can easily check that that's a group of matrices, that when you multiply two such matrices, you get another one. Um, that's the group. Uh, then it's Lie algebra uh, should be given by differentiating. And, uh, and it's not hard to check that if you differentiate, and I'm trying again to write a little German N here, which is, of course, almost impossible for me. So I'll write it as some sort of N-like thing. And then um, it's given by differentiating as you move through a family of these through the identity matrix. So the identity matrix occurs when A, B, C are all zero. As we move a little bit away from the identity matrix, we can move A, B, and C arbitrarily. So it looks like, uh, sorry, zero, A, B, zero, 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 C, zero. Why are the zeros down here? This thing had ones. But as we move through the identity, our velocity has, this isn't changing. The one's always a one, so its derivative is zero. The derivative of a constant one is zero. These are all constants as we move around in this group. So the derivatives are all zero as we move around in the group. So that means the velocity of anything that looks like this is something that looks like this. It probably should have called them by different letters instead of A, B, C. This should be like A dot B dot C dot or something like that to make the notation um, fit better. Um, uh, but anyway, A, B, and C, those can be any 
the real numbers. So those are the velocities of such matrices as we move through the identity matrix. And I'll leave you to check the brackets. The brackets are, of course, not hard to calculate. You take two such guys, so 0, A, B, 0, 0, C, 0, 0, 0, and you bracket with another one, say 0, A prime, B prime, 0, 0, C prime. Prime doesn't mean derivative here, it just means some other one, but I want to use the same letter again. Um, and you just calculate out by multiplying them in this order, and it's attracting multiplying the opposite order, right? Because the bracket of two matrices is AB minus BA. Okay, so it makes it possible to calculate out this bracket, which I won't do for you. It's not hard to do, to ex just expand out the product. So I want to use this machinery to, to see if we can figure out when some Lie groups are the same and when they're different. We should at this point be able to, to, to use this um, little bit of microscopic understanding of the Lie group to determine when they're the same and when they're different. So I'm going to try and work out as an example uh, three different Lie groups. SL2R, that's the set of two by two uh, matrices with determinant one with real entries. SO3 is that's a different collection of matrices, three by three uh, matrices, um, with um, uh, which are rotation matrices. And then, um, so let's not worry too much about that. We've written them down in detail above. And then um, the Heisenberg group, and this is the set of all 1A, B, 0, 1C, 0, 0, 1 matrices, we again with real entries. Um, now, you might say, these can't be the same. This one is act is 2 by 2s, this one's 3 by 3s. But that turns out not to work. Um, it's possible that as abstract Lie groups, they might be the same. That is to say, there might be an isomorphism. They might be diffeomorphic manifolds. It's possible for two different Lie groups to arise in ma inside matrices in different sizes of matrices because this one might actually secretly be the same as this one, just acting differently as matrices. That does happen. Um, so uh, I'll leave you to, to come up with examples. There are several in the, in the notes of, uh, of examples of different uh, sizes of matrices. For example, one by one quaternion uh, unit matrices uh, are the same as two by two complex special unitary which we saw previously. So it's it, so so just the fact that these are 2 by 2s and these are 3 by 3s doesn't tell you anything about whether or not as Lie groups they're the same. Um, so it's it's not obvious whether or not these are the same. Let's work out their Lie algebras. So the Lie algebras, again we're using little letters to write the Lie algebras. This guy is determinant 1 matrices and we said these guys should be therefore trace 0. 2 by 2 trace equal to 0. The derivative of the de condition determinant equals 1 determinant equals 1 is the condition trace equals 0. Somehow deriv uh, determinant when you differentiate at the identity element becomes trace. And 1 when you differentiate is constant so it becomes 0. Um, so what do those look like as matrices? Well uh, we can put any entry in there but then to get the trace to be 0 in 2 by 2 you have to put the negative of it here so that they'll balance out to give 0 trace and then we can put anything here, and then we can put um, anything uh, here. So A, B, and C are real. So uh, one of the things we can look at is just their, their sub-algebras. Um, and we're looking for algebra structure. So, um, okay, so we have SL2 is this guy, SO3 is the set of all, we wrote them in this nice notation, which was um, uh, that we had, where they put my minus signs, minus C, B, minus A, 0, uh, 0, A, B, uh, minus B, C. Okay, that was these guys, such A, B, and C are real numbers. And then uh, N3 was the set of matrices 0, A, B, 0, 0, C, 0, 0, 0. Now how do I see if these are the same? What I want to say is that if, they're, if these are going to be the same as groups, they should have the same Lie algebras. That is to say, this guy, this three-dimensional vector space, this three-dimensional vector space, this three-dimensional vector space, if, one, if, these, if they say these two are going to be the same, I should be able to map these vectors to these vectors by some linear transformation. It doesn't have to be anything obvious like taking A to AB to B, C to C. 
but some linear combination of ABCs here becomes some linear combination of ABCs here and vice versa so that it would match up brackets. That's what I have to do because we now know that the bracket is an essential part of the Lie group structure, that it's inside the Lie group. The Lie group knows its own bracket. It doesn't know whether it's represented as 2x2 two two matrices or 3x3 three three matrices. It has no idea, but it knows that it's, it knows what its bracket is. So there has to be some way to identify these uh, match-up brackets and, and match up them up as algebras under bracket. Um, so one observation is that inside this guy, we can find a nice um, A, B, uh, 0 minus A, uh, the set of these, this is two-dimensional because we've only got an A and a B, we set C to 0. This is contained in SL2R, and it's easy to check that it's bracket closed. Bracket two of these two things that look like this, and you can check, you get another one. So um, so this is a, is, um, is a two-dimensional uh, subalgebra. When we bracket, we get the things that look like this. We get more things that look like this. Um, so that, that's convenient because we can compare it to the other ones we know about. Um, so, um, for example, we could ask, what about SO3? Um, well, if we look at SO3, uh, we know that that is isomorphic to, as a Lie algebra, it's isomorphic to R3 with the cross product. And one thing we know about cross products is that if you take two vectors... Uh, and you compute their cross product, it's perpendicular to both of them. So that means that we can't have any t no two-dimensional subalgebras. Why? Because a two-dimensional subalgebra would have to be a two-dimensional subspace of R3. Remember we're saying these are isomorphic, this abstract SO3, and this much more concrete, just R3 with cross product. But they're the same thing. So if I had a, a subalgebra that was two-dimensional, I'd be able to take two vectors in it, it would be the span of those two vectors. It would be a plane. But then their product doesn't lie inside there. It brackets out of there. So that can't happen um, because um, uh, any, say, vector, cross product, any vector is perpendicular to both the vectors. So, uh, so that doesn't work. So that means, therefore, we've discovered now that, that, um, that SO3 is not uh, isomorphic to SL2R. Um, and as a consequence, uh, SO3, the group, cannot be isomorphic to SL2R. So that gives us at least some trick to show that things are really different from one another. The symmetries of some geometric structure aren't the same as the symmetries of some other one. Now, what do we do to, to figure out the other cases? We wanted to work out for SL, going back, we wanted to work out uh, for SL. 2, SO3, and N3, which are isomorphic to which. Let's try and see if we can work out what about SL2 and N3. Let's see if we can see something about N3 that we can work with. Now, N3, when we compute out the brackets, let's work out a bracket of 0, A, B, uh, 0, 0, C, 0, 0, 0, with uh, matrix... Uh, I sometimes forget to write the, the comma here, and I think that's fine. There, if I put brackets around it, it means you have to be computing the bracket. So, um, so it, you don't really need the comma in the middle between the factors. Um, 0, x, y. Let's take two elements. So they have to look like this for some ABC. I'll call the ABCs x, y, z over here. Um, uh, z, uh, 0, 0, 0. And you can calculate that out. Again, what do you do? You multiply the matrices in the given order, this times this this times this. Then you subtract multiplying in the opposite order, this times this, as matrices. So you compute out the matrix product in this way, then you compute out the matrix product the opposite way, this times this, and then you take the difference. And I won't do a, all that linear algebra in front of you, so I'll just write down the answer is, if you compute it out, you should get AZ minus B minus, no, X, sorry, XC, um, 0, 0. Okay, so what have we found? We found that... Um, the bracket of any two elements uh, has to have this special form. It has just an element here. So what we found is that there's this, this n, which is this algebra. So we have this algebra n3 consisting of all the matrices, a, b, 0, c, 0, 0. It's three-dimensional. But we found that if you bracket anything from n3 with anything else from n3, that's these two guys here, you get something inside here, the brackets. Um, the brackets all have the form that they have zeros everywhere except this entry. 
something here. And that's only one dimensional. So what we found is we've got N3 is a three dimensional, the algebra, a three dimensional algebra of under the brackets. But that when you bracket elements of N3 with other elements of N3, you, you forced inside a one dimensional subalgebra. So that's some sort of algebra structure. But it doesn't happen for SO3 or for SL2. We can check if you take brackets of anything in SL2 with anything in SL2. Um, I won't do it for you, but it's not too hard to, to convince yourself with, by trying a few examples. You get all of SL2. Anything in SL2 can be written as a bracket of two things in SL2. And in fact, the same thing again works. This is just a cross product fact. Any vector is a cross product of two other vectors. How do I write it? Well, I take the vector and I want to write it as a cross product. So I take its perpendicular plane and then I create an orthonormal basis for that plane. And then I just have to a bracket things in an orthonormal basis, and the appropriate, the appropriate scaling, rescale them, and you'll get this guy. So, uh, so that's easy to see that anything, any vector, that's any vector here, is um, is somehow uh, the product of a vector here uh, and a vector. Well, it's a bit hard to draw, but um, uh, in here. Um, okay, so. Uh, uh, so, uh, so we can say that uh, any vector output is the product of two inputs. And that's not the case up here. We saw, showed that only these special one-dimensional subalgebra family actually arise as brackets of things in that family. So what we've discovered is that we have at least three three-dimensional Lie groups. SL2R is a three-dimensional Lie group. SO3 is a three-dimensional Lie group, and N3 is a three-dimensional Lie group, and none of them are isomorphic to one another. Uh, this isn't actually, this one's actually very different from the other two, because this one is actually compact. You could check that, and these are non-compact, and you can easily check that. So it's not hard to see from sort of global aspects that this guy is different than the other two. But the fact that N3 and SL2 are different is not obvious by just looking at the um, the abstractly written uh, multiplication operation on the matrices that go the collection of matrices we're looking at. So we've actually done something substantial in discovering that we can you know, we can use a microscope to look at a Lie group. Under the microscope, the Heisenberg group no longer looks like a group but like an algebra. This algebra under this bracket operation, and when you see that, you can really see structure coming out about the nature of the algebra. The whole point here is that. Groups are complicated, and Lie groups are complicated nonlinear objects, but their Lie algebras are a linear approximation, and we're good at linear algebra. And so we can see what's happening, some kind of structure in the underlying linear algebra. And that's really where, where we're able to get global results about the, the fact that, that SO, where are we? SO, uh, SL2 and N3 are not the same. These can't be the same because they have different algebra structure going on uh, when we bracket, not not the when you don't work in the groups themselves, we just bracket in their Lie algebras. And so somehow everything that we know about these Lie groups comes not from working with group structure, but just working with the velocities of the group elements. And this is a general sort of philosophical point that it's hard to understand Lie groups because they're global objects. It's much easier to understand their tangent vectors because this is somehow linear algebra is much more elementary. Um, and so it's always better to try to do as much as you can with Lie algebras and as little as you can, as little as you have to with, with the groups. Next time we'll try to um, see if we can find ways to start with just Lie algebra information, sort of infinitesimal data, and then see if we can work our way up toward getting some global data about, some global information about the groups. So we're really interested in sort of going from the small to the large. Now that we have a microscopic perspective on the groups, we want to sort of see if we can go from microscopic to macroscopic. And it's actually surprisingly strong how, how much we can do.